In the previous video, we introduced the rotation of axes for trusses, uh, and this, uh, in this video, we will talk about a problem in the programming of the finite element of trusses. This prob uh, problem is called the logistic problem. Uh, in, uh, in earlier uh, programs using the finite element modeling of bars, we didn't have a, a problem in assembling the global stiffness matrix for the bar because each of the elements uh, is connected to the following element at a node that's well defined by number and location right away. However, in a truss, this is not the case at all. For example, in the truss shown here, the element number 8 is connected to node number 6 and node number 4 and node number six is already connecting eight, nine, two, and five, while four is connecting three, four, seven, and eight. Uh, and similarly, this will happen in uh, each other, uh, in every other node. So there is always a problem in identifying where to put the elements of the, uh, sorry, where to put uh, the parts of the element matrix in the global matrix. Uh, also, for each element, there may be a different area and water elasticity, not to mention the length that's depending on the location of the nodes uh, connected through that element, as well as the angle of rotation of the element with respect to the global X axis. That's why we need to create a register for the nodes and the elements to uh, uh, store all this information. For example, here, uh, for the previous uh, truss, we had six nodes. Each node had its X and Y coordinates, as well as externally applied forces and the degrees of freedom. Let's go back here. Uh, 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 each of these nodes may move in the X and Y direction. So each of them has a U and a V uh, degree of freedom. What's the number of that degree of freedom in the global matrix? That's what we have to identify for each node as well. Uh, the coordinates uh, for each element, there is E and A, and the forces applied to it. Okay. So here we listed, this is an input done by the user, either through a graphical user interface or manually by inputting the numbers into the, uh, into the uh, matrix or, or the register, as well as the Y coordinates of each of the nodes. Here we identify the externally applied forces. Note that I'm putting zeros in front of the, uh, the, uh, the unknown reaction forces. That's because I'm going to define the um, support nodes or the support degrees of freedom in the program. So these zeros will not really mess up our calculations. Also here, uh, for node number one, I chose that you will have the degree of freedom number one while V will have the degree of freedom number two, and I will follow the same sequence for all the other nodes. This is the register that we will have to enter to the program, and this is the nodes register. Another register will be for the elements, element numbers. Each element has its model of elasticity and area. For this problem, I'm using the same values for all the elements. However, here I have to uh, select the starting and the end nodes for each of the elements. Uh, 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 notice I, that I use the word select. Simply, if I use that for element number seven, for example, the starting node is four and the end node is two, that will not affect the uh, general, uh, sorry, the global matrix. It's simply going to uh, rotate the element 100 degree, uh, 180 degrees around itself. 
So uh, this will not really create any problem if you uh, decided that four is the start node and two is the end node. So you don't have to worry about the order, but make sure that each element is properly uh, identified to be connected to its two nodes. Now that we created the register, let's uh, uh, go and have a look on uh, how uh, does the uh, MATLAB code look uh, like or the Octave code look like. Here, uh, the uh, Trust program, you can download this from uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, uh, the link is available on the uh, course website uh, under the video. Uh, now we start the program by clearing the memory, clearing the console, and then closing all the graphical, uh, all the figures. Uh, you don't have to use this, but I prefer to add it as a starting for all the programs to have uh, no problems with other running programs. Uh, then uh, we, uh, the input data of the problem, uh, I use the modulus of elasticity uh, of the aluminum, the cross section area is 10 centime uh, sorry, 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter. Uh, uh, number of elements is 6, uh, sorry, number of nodes is 6, while the number of elements is 9. Here is the register for the nodes. Uh, you can see here that uh, I used uh, the value of L uh, to be 1 uh, in order to uh, calculate all this. Here, uh, the uh, co uh, the nodes numbers uh, number one two three four five and six each has its x axis uh, x coordinate y coordinate applied force in the x direction applied force in the y direction and the degrees of freedom associated with it exactly like what we had here in our uh, in our program, uh, sorry, in our presentation, the same order, except that we didn't add the node number since it's already the same index as the matrix we are using. If we go now back to the program, we will see the creation of the element register. Here, each element, the starting node, the end node, the modulus of elasticity, and the area for the nine different elements we have. Now I'm going to define the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that one degrees one, two, and four are fixed. If you look here at the nodes, one is a, a, a motion in the x direction, two is a motion in the y direction, while a uh, degree of freedom number four here is a motion in the y direction. To make sure that we are okay, let's get back to uh, our presentation and look at the truss. Node number one has U uh, and V, the degree of freedom number one and the degree of freedom number two. Both are fixed. This point cannot move. While point number two or node number two can move in the X direction. That's why the U is free while I'm constraining the V. So the degree of freedom number four is uh, constrained. Now, uh, after identifying the boundary conditions, we will create the empty global matrices, the global stiffness matrix, which is a, a, a 2n by 2n, and the uh, global force matrix, which is 2n by 1, uh, stiffness matrix here in octave uh, 2 times n will create zero is 2 times n will create a square matrix but I can just uh, uh, use 2 times n here again uh, to make sure that it is a square matrix this will not really create any difference then we will create a loop that runs over all the elements to uh, create each element's global stiffness matrix, then use that to, uh, uh, or oh, sorry, to, and then put that into the uh, global stiffness matrix. First step is identifying the element nodes and data. 
uh, it, uh, for the element number i, uh, it is connected to node number one, and node number two has a stiffness and an area all from the register elements, the, the register elements. Then we will get the coordinates by using the element, no, uh, the node numbers. We will get the x-axis, the x-coordinate of the nodes, and the y-coordinates of the nodes from the nodes register. Then. From that, we also get the degrees of freedom associated with that element. So UV now uh, it contains the global degrees of freedom of this element, the i-th element. The following step would be creating the stiffness matrix for each element. Uh, the stiffness matrix, as you may recall, needs the length. So the length will be just the square root of delta x squared and delta y squared. Uh, then the cosine and the sine of the angles will uh, be calculated by dividing the x distance over the length, the y distance over the length. Notice here I don't have to worry about the uh, I don't have to worry about the sine of the angle because simply it will be contained into the y, delta y and delta x directly. That's why I told you if uh, uh, you chose, if you flip the numbering of the nodes, uh, the, uh, the, the same, the problem will not really uh, change at all. <coughs> then I create here the rotation matrix P, which is cosine minus sine zero zero sine cosine zero zero and so on as uh, you uh, could see in uh, the presentation the stiffness matrix the local stiffness matrix is ones and zeros multiplied by the uh, uh, modulus of elasticity area and divided by uh, the length then we get the global uh, uh, stiffness matrix for this element by multiplying it from one side by uh, uh, the transformation matrix transpose and from the other side by the transformation matrix. I notice here that I'm, ha I'm having an extra index here. Uh, that's because I'm going to save the global stiffness matrix for each element and the global transformation matrix for each element. Uh, in order to be able to use them later uh, to find the forces in each element. Now, uh, after getting the uh, stiffness matrix of the element in the global coordinate, I use it directly, I put it directly using this uh, trick uh, uh, from the defined UV. I'm going to directly add the element global stiffness matrix into the global stiffness matrix uh, right away. Uh, you can check if this works uh, uh, yourself. Uh, I have already checked it and it works uh, just fine. Now, uh, what we need to do is uh, add the uh, stiffness, uh, sorry, uh, finding the uh, global stiffness matrix. Uh, I'm sorry, again. Uh, here I'm going to fill the global force vector uh, by using the nodes data. Remember here in the nodes data, uh, I had the X forces and the Y forces and replaced the uh, unknown uh, reaction forces by zeros. So uh, by looping over the each uh, node, I'm going to put each of the forces in the, its uh, position in the global force uh, vector. Now, uh, we are going to create the uh, auxiliary equations to, uh, that we can use to calculate the reactions of force. Following that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, remove the columns associated with the constraints. Remember, DCs contains one Two and four. Here it is. Okay, the uh, the degrees of freedom that are constrained. So I'm just removing them from uh, the uh, auxiliary 
uh, stiffness uh, matrix. Uh, then I'll create the reduced stiffness matrix, which is the global matrix, uh, minus or removing the uh, boundary condition vectors and rows. Here I'm removing the rows, and here I'm removing the columns. Uh, and also I'm having the reduced force uh, vector by removing the uh, constrained uh, forces or the constrained degrees of freedom from the global force vector. Finally, this step solves the uh, problem uh, by getting the displacements, uh, uh, inverting the reduced stiffness matrix and multiplying it by the reduced force matrix. Uh, notice here that I didn't use inverse, I used uh, a backslash, which is um, another form of saying that I am inverting the matrix, but actually it uses other techniques that can be helpful and usually faster than the full inversion. Of part of the uh, uh, Mat, uh, sorry, the octave and MATLAB environment. Then the reactions can be calculated directly by multiplying the auxiliary stiffness matrix by the uh, given displacements. This will give you the reactions right away. And finally, to obtain the element forces, you need to get uh, uh, the displacement vector, the whole displacement vector, which is actually uh, here going to be uh, created uh, by two uh, vectors. Here the BC's complement uh, is a vector that's uh, an empty uh, uh, vector. Uh, sorry, it's the vector with all numbers of degrees of freedom, but then we remove the uh, constrained degrees of freedom from it. The displacement vector, the whole displacement vector, will be zeros to start. And then we are going to add the given or the solution of the problem. We are going to put it in its place in the displacement vector. Okay. Finally, I'm going to run through all the elements, uh, get the UV, get the forces in each element by multiplying uh, the uh, uh, transformation matrix by the global stiffness matrix by the displacements of that uh, element. Uh, and you can see this uh, by uh, uh, running the program. Uh, this, uh, uh, here I added a negative sign uh, because the tension uh, in the F1 uh, vector is going to be uh, negative. Let's run it and see what happens. Here, the displacements given, uh, here are all the displacements, U, V, U, V, U, V. Then the reaction forces, 100 minus 43 and 43. Uh, the element forces are given here. Uh, by uh, for uh, uh, each of the nine elements, uh, each has a force uh, that's uh, applied on it, and uh, that's how the uh, program works. Uh, if you need to use this program for a different problem, all what you will do is change the nodes register and the element register. Of course, you have to identify how many nodes are there and how many elements are there, the modulus of elasticity and the area, if they are the same, or put them directly into this register, then the boundary conditions. Everything else will run uh, without any changes from you. Uh, all you need to do again is just input to that. I hope this was clear. Uh, probably some of you found this uh, quite uh, long, uh, but uh, I hope that if you uh, get the program and run it, uh, you will understand uh, better how it's working uh, and play around with it, change the problem data and see how it changes uh, to solve uh, different uh, problems. Uh, this concludes what we had to 
say about bars and crosses. Uh, to summarize in this lesson, we introduced using the symbolic manipulator uh, maxima uh, to uh, derive the finite element model of a bar, a two node bar and a three node bar. Then uh, we introduced uh, a simple program to solve two dimensional truss problems. Uh, this program will run for any problem you have in 2D, uh, given uh, the elements, the nodes, and the constraints of that uh, problem. Thank you very much, and I hope you join us in the coming lessons about finite element analysis.